Okay, welcome. I hope you can see and hear me okay. I'll trust that um, Jacinta, who's helped organize this event, will keep me right if you can't. But very warm welcome to this evening's session, which is just designed to give you a little bit of an insight into the inclusive practice program at the University of Aberdeen. My name's Dr. Kirsten Darling McQuiston, which is a huge mouthful, so Kirsten is fine. Um, and I'm the current program director of our inclusive practice program which is a great privilege. So I, I aim to talk you through the programme, what uh, types of things, what it might entail and respond really to your questions that you might have. So we'll have plenty of space for questions at the end of this brief overview. OK, so let me just make sure I can move my slide along. Here we are. So this evening, what will we try and uh, cover? Well, um, really just some Sort of try and capture the essence of our program. That's what's key for me, I guess. And we'll explore issues, for example, who is this inclusive pra practice program for? What will I learn? How will I be assessed? What does master's level learning entail? And what does studying in online involve? Some of you might be familiar with studying online, others might not be, and you might have lots of questions around that. And those would be very natural and expected. And finally, we want to guide you into what you can do if you are interested in undertaking some master's level credits in inclusive practice. OK, so that's our aims. And like I say, there'll be plenty of space for you to ask questions, anything that I haven't covered in this overview. OK, so the inclusive practice programme, what is it? What, what drives it? What is it all about? Essentially, it's built upon the, the fundamental belief that all learners have the same rights and are of equal worth, irrespective of ability, cultural background, race, gender, age, etc. We could go on and on. OK, so every learner is of equal worth. That's the underpinning idea that drives all aspects of our programme. And the, what the programme really aims to do is to support and help practitioners to kind of reflect upon, review and enhance the, the learning experiences for children, young people, adults as well, including those with additional support needs. And it does that by, I suppose, helping you to carve out time and opportunities to really examine what you're currently doing. And we always acknowledge that every one of our students that come onto the course bring a range of expertise and experiences. You know, that you'll already be doing so much. So it's just about looking at what we're doing and bringing in new insights from the literature, from our engagement through the programme to further enhance and tweak and make slight changes to practice to your practice. And we really encourage you to do that by engaging with each other as students and engage with each other's different perspectives and experiences through opportunities for sustained discussion and critical reflection and appraisal. OK, so that's the real essence of the programme. So who is it designed for? Well, essentially any professional working in an educational setting. OK, and so we have a range of students on our programme. We have teachers, we have early years practitioners, we have university lecturers, um, further education lecturers. So it's really a broad range of professionals working within an educational setting and, and that certainly enriches the programme as we learn from each other and hear from each other at different stages of that educational spectrum. A key part of the, each of the courses on the programme is that the um, you will be asked to explore some of the key ideas and concepts in practice uh, and that will form the basis of of the assessments therefore it's essential that you're currently based in a workplace and able to make those changes and reflect on them um, just to give yourself the best opportunity to be able to be successful 
Normally, applicants should have um, a relevant honours degree with a 2-2 or above by a recognised university or body. The word normally is um, key there. If you have maybe don't have those qualifications, but you have equivalent experiences as programme director, I'm very happy to um, you know, look at your personal situation and context and make a decision based on your experiences and what you can bring to the programme. What will I learn? Well, a range of things. We have three specific inclusive practice courses on the programme. Inclusive pedagogy, participatory approaches to literacy difficulties and curriculum transformation and change. Now, these all are worth, and this might seem like a foreign language to you, that's OK if it does. These are all worth 30 credits at master's level. Um, so they have that kind of, they carry that weight. So once you achieve those courses, you will build up credits. And, and on a further slide, I'll explain, you know, how many credits equates to what kind of qualification. So it might be that you're interested in just maybe doing a course or two, might be interested that you're interested and uh, it might be that you're interested in going to, through to the diploma level. That would be the equivalent of four courses. And it might be that you're interested in going all the way through to doing a full master's. So we'll talk about those different possible routes. But these are our inclusive practice courses that are specific to inclusive practice. There is also a more generic course titled Research Methods for Professional Learning, which also carries 30 credits. This course runs every January and it's sort of essential if you want to go on to diploma or master's level because it gives you the skills, insights and knowledges to undertake a piece of sustained inquiry into practice. OK, I'm going to elaborate now on each of the specific inclusive practice courses so you can get a bit of a sense about what they are about. So inclusive pedagogy. This course I often recommend as a good starting point to the programme because it introduces the key concept of um, inclusive pedagogy, pedagogy, sorry, which has been developed by Lanny Florian and Christine Black Hawkins. And they de they've de developed the concept by studying the practices of primary and secondary classroom teachers who think about learning and teaching in novel ways. And what they found is that an inclusive pedagogical approach acknowledges and responds to difficulties children face in their learning in ways that respect the dignity of each child and young person within the classroom community. And that's often a key point for reflection, contemplation and consideration as we consider what we can do to support all learners in a way that respects everybody's dignity. Um, so that opens up lots of opportunities for fruitful discussion between myself and the students. So through this course, what we do is we really explore the underpinning principles of inclusive pedagogy and you have the opportunity to apply them in a really kind of contextually appropriate way within your own setting. One of our next courses is titled Participatory Approaches to Literacy Difficulties. Um, and this course, it runs every second year, every second August, this course begins. Um, and the, the kind of the staggering of my two, the two August courses enables students to work through the programme and to experience a full range of courses. That's why it's designed that way. But essentially through this course, we critically examine, examine the principles underpinning so-called participative approaches, focusing on how pupil or learner participation can be enabled through the development of a more inclusive environment. Alongside sort of unpicking these ideas around participation, we'll also explore 
theoretical frameworks for understanding literacy diff difficulties within an inclusive context. And so it's very much underpinned by principles of social justice and equality of access. And these two kind of sort of conceptual explorations or theoretical explorations, we bring them together and we encourage you to design and create, co-create off with the, with your learners, uh, very much an inclusive participatory intervention focused on a particular li literacy difficulty, which a learner, a group of learners in your setting might be experiencing and explore how a change can, can contribute to a more inclusive learning and teaching. Okay. The third inclusive practice course is titled Curriculum Transformation and Change. Um, this is a course that's currently running and I'm currently really enjoying teaching and exploring with a new group of students. And it's really looking at this kind of the concept of change as it relates to the development of a more inclusive curricula. And it considers the influences and assumptions that can shape the curriculum. And the course is very much designed to support students to develop an understanding of their, their relationship and the interrelationship amongst the kind of organisational systems and that impact on the curriculum and understand their role within that. So, for example, we've been spending a lot of time um, exploring and unpicking the role of an educator in, in um, curriculum making and in influencing the curriculum and shaping the curriculum, which has been really exciting and very much very empowering for the students on the programme. Of our inclusive practice courses, um, really have a core element that, that sort of draws them all together, and that's that they all entail collaborative inquiry. So they're all designed to, to give you the opportunity as a professional working in an educational setting to engage in sort of a, a um, collaborative inquiry with your learners, with families, with your colleagues in order to make a very small change. And in this way, it is our hope that the assessments um, that, that take place within our courses are really meaningful and can impact on positive and helpful change within your setting. And we, we never want our students to feel alone in this process. So that's why we put such an emphasis on collaboration. And I'll elaborate a little bit more on that as I discuss um, the kind of how we organise the learning and teaching on the programme. But collaborative inquiry is a really exciting part of it and it means that you can make the course work for you and your setting and the dilemmas you're currently facing as a, as a professional. Just very briefly, um, the, the more generic course which all students um, doing a master's in education at at the University of Aberdeen will undertake if they want to um, work at diploma or full master's level research methods for professional learning. Um, this course is available, as I said, to all students. And um, so it's not in specific to inclusive practice, but it absolutely contributes to your developing knowledge and understanding and gives you the tools you need to progress onto full master's level. So um, I've touched upon this, probably not explicitly enough, so I've, I've dedicated a slide here to help us to understand the different kind of pathways, if you like, through the programme. So I mentioned credits. So if you undertake two 30 credit courses, this will result in a postgraduate certificate in inclusive practice. So normally that might look like perhaps the inclusive pedagogy course to begin with, then followed by curriculum transformation and change or participatory approaches to literacy difficulties. If however you want to go a bit further than that and explore doing a full diploma in um, inclusive practice, then you need to undertake 
four 30 credit courses. So normally that looks like inclusive pedagogy, curriculum transformation and change, or participatory approaches um, to literacy difficulties. In fact, you need to do both of them, but the order, um, it just depends which one is running, which year you begin. Um, and also the research methods for professional learning. If you're still keen, still interested, still excited by the programme and, and many of our students do this and um, then they go on to also undertaking the master's project. This is a little bit um, more self guided in that you have a real choice over what it is that you, you know, you've you've done all this learning. What are the what are the key points that have really resonated with you? What would you like to explore further, explore more deeply within your practice? So the master's project really gives you autonomy to be creative and to explore changes within your practice at a much deeper, deeper level. So this usually takes place over a year, year and a half. And if you complete for 30 credit courses plus the master's project, then you end up having a full master's degree in inclusive practice, um, which is very exciting indeed. And it can contribute to additional qualifications and being recognised as having um, particular skill set and knowledges that can help you um, if you want to progress um, on to, for example, become um, uh, an additional sport needs teacher. So, so exciting possibilities there. OK, but first of all, to get that part, we have to go through an assessment process and and I've written a little note at the top of the slide, which is really, um, really heartfelt and genuine. And that is assessment has been an area of continued reflection and development for for us as a course team. And, and that has been that reflection has been further encouraged by the implications of COVID and the impact it had on the ability of our students to engage in the ways they could engage. Um, so we, we're we constantly trying to reflect on and enhance our own practices to ensure that our assessments are as inclusive as possible while maintaining the academic standards needed for master's level learning. So really importantly, we've embedded informative assessment within each of the courses and this usually is submitted prior to making any of those changes undertaking that inquiry into practice and that's designed to give you be really supportive and give you timely feedback in order that you know you don't feel alone that you feel like we are with you we have your back through the process and can give you advice um you know often students want to change everything and uh, which is understandable but we just help peel that back and think about how, how can we make this more manageable and achievable within within the time scale we also do have um, a summative assessment for each of the courses, and that is for all of them a 6,000 word um, a written assignment uh, with 10% flexibility. Um, that can feel a bit daunting, um, but I promise you students usually are grappling at the end with how to get the word count down to 6,000 words. So um, that tends to be the challenge more than the other way around. Again, building on from our experiences, particularly recently with COVID, is that our assignment guidelines are designed to be flexible, adaptable to your setting, to your circumstances. This is key. Um, you know, we have to be flexible. We have to understand that things change. Um, circumstances change all the time. So flexibility and compassion, and I, I'm kind of defining compassion as an understanding of context, are really key for us. And, and we hope, uh, well, our, our students certainly feed back to us that they feel supported through the assessment process, which can be daunting, can be scary. But um, as I say, we, we take a really kind of try and enact really carefully our inclusive values, particularly around um, assessments. So I said in the previous slide that we have to get this 
balance between um, being flexible and compassionate with kind of maintaining these kind of master's level learning um, as defined kind of more universally across all university settings. And so what does that mean? What does master's level learning entail? What does that look like? What does that involve? And um, so over the next two slides, I'm going to try and unpick that a little bit for you. I realise I'm probably uh, rattling through these slides and I um, I can't see you or any questions that might be coming up. So I'm going to just take a little drink of water now and then we'll unpick a bit about the master's level learning. OK, so what do we uh, hope that you'll learn through the programme? Well, we, it's really about advancing your knowledge. Again, we appreciate every student comes with knowledge, experience, expertise. So it's about surfacing that and building on it. But importantly, we want you to develop your critical understanding relating to professional practice. And criticality is a theme that comes through um, <laughs> most master's level learning courses. It's that ability to be open to new ideas, to shift thinking, to be aware of your frame of reference and understand where that's come from and to unpick it and challenge it. So that criticality is a really key part of master's level learning. So it requires an openness um, and, and sometimes that openness takes time to come. Some learners come in really open, ready to have their perspective shifted. Others, it's a slower process and either is fine. We really build on the capacity to apply knowledge and understanding within your professional practice. As I said, that's a key part of our assignments to make sure they're meaningful and worthwhile. We want to help you develop your critical awareness of discipline related and wider social and ethical issues. We often grapple with the complexity of education and how things are, why they are the way they are, what, what are the historical social context that has resulted in things being as they are. So we, we really delve into the, the complexity of the education system. And we want to help you to build your capacity to use and generate research evidence to enhance your practice. This is a key part um, of learning and teaching at all levels and all different educational settings, but it can be daunting. So we do this in a really supportive way with each other and kind of unpick what that evidence might be and how we can you draw on these insights to impact on practice. Okay. Further to that, and you'll see some um, echoing of the, some of the key ideas here, um, we really encourage you to critically reflect upon practice in order to inform professional actions really aimed at the improvement of practice. And that improvement might be really tiny and small, and that's OK. It might be a slight shift in an attitude. It might be a slight shift in perspective. Um, that's OK, but these slight shifts can have a really powerful impact. We really, as I said, we want to deal with the complexity uh, and, and not oversimplify things to help us arrive at sound professional jump, uh, ju uh, judgments. We encourage you to work collaboratively, um, collaboratively and we really want you to develop your autonomy, your agency as an educational professional, your initiative, your creativity, your ability to problem solve within your setting. Um, there usually ends up being lots of problem solving and uh, that can be part of the fun and um, that can be where students often end up exploring things that they, they didn't necessarily set out to explore, but just the way things unfolded uh, and that's part of the process. And finally, we, we really want you to build the capacity to plan and undertake sustained and systematic inquiry into your practice. OK, so that that's kind of the essence of working at master's level. And, and some of these things might feel within grasp. Some of them might feel a bit beyond, but we support you in, in engaging with all of these things. I'm going to go on now to talk a little bit about the studying online um, again for some of you that might be very familiar 
for others you may have never done it before and it might be slightly daunting and you might wonder if you get um, the same experience as working in person face to face. Um, so what we do, how we organise the learning and teaching is what we, we have online workshops and we synchronous online workshops. So that means we're we're live interacting together. It's not like this where I can hear or see you. I'd be able to see you and respond to your questions and and really work from with and from you. And each course usually has about five or six of synchronous online workshops taking place and these are usually kind of within the the course they're usually front loaded so initially you might find that we're meeting each week or maybe every second week and that's in order to allow us to explore the key ideas and concepts and then give you time to think about them in your practice and make change to practice before writing up the impact of those changes. So that tends to be the organisation. And we use a platform Collaborate to do this. And we really try and I'm constantly, uh, myself and the team are constantly learning and developing our own skills in order to harness the, the affordances of Collaborate to really encourage discussion, debate and sharing of relevant perspectives and experiences. And from feedback from our students, that's what they love. Um, we we often use breakout groups which give give our students opportunity to talk with each other, to share their experiences, to share their dilemmas, to share the challenges of trying to be inclusive because we are not hiding away from the fact that it can be extremely challenging. And the students get so much from talking with other interested um, professionals who might be having very similar dilemmas or completely different, but both are useful. And what we do is we make sure we always record our, our, our workshops so that if you need to revisit any of the key ideas, then you're able to do so. And it's also really important because we have quite uh, an amazing international community now that our students who are in time zones where it might be 12 o'clock at night, one o'clock in the morning, and um, they're very good. They often try and make it along, but just in case they need to go off to bed, can come and revisit any parts of the workshop. So that's great that we have the ability to do that. And that's always very welcome. In addition to the sort of face to face, if you like, online, live, synchronous workshops. We also have asynchronous weekly engagement activities, and that means essentially you can do them in your own time. So each week you'll be given a kind of a provocation, I guess, a bit of reading to do and some reflective questions, and you're invited to respond to these and post your responses on a discussion board. And what works really nicely is when when our students take ownership of the discussion board and respond to each other and say, oh, yeah, I, I see what you mean there. Um, what about this? What about that? And you can see that's when everyone starts to get the most out of the online experience. Um, and it's it creates as well a kind of living resource for you all. So when it comes to the kind of the writing up part of the assignment, you can go back and say, oh yes, yeah, so-and-so had a really good idea about that piece of literature and you can share ideas and help each other out. Um, so, so that's a really exciting part of learning online together. More exciting still, in my mind anyway, is the kind of the collaborative elements. And I have to say, I think this has been increasing with them um, I guess all of our um, increasing familiar, familiarity with uh, online platforms. So for example, my students last year undertaking a master's on top of everything else with a global pandemic going on and we're still in that situation. We're reaching out to each other in new ways. The students would meet informally in Zoom and have WhatsApp groups and they would really kind of take that collaboration to another le level, which which was really excellent to see. And I could see how that really supported each of their learning and had a really positive impact um, on their experience of the course. And what's, what's sort of, as I've touched upon, really wonderful is that with this programme, 
if you decide to apply and join us, you will be entering into an international learning community. Doesn't matter where you're joining from, we all become international students with such varied experiences that we bring together and share and kind of use our, our varying lived experiences to date to help each other and make sense of challenging situations. So that for me is the the most wonderful affordance of working online is that we can bring groups of diverse groups of learners together in a way that we just wouldn't been able to do otherwise. So um, for, for any of the drawbacks, I think this is a real benefit and a real opportunity that I know our students who are currently working with us particularly enjoy. So that brings me to the end of this, this part of the presentation with lots of space for any questions you might have. Um, but if you are interested, please do feel free. And I think Jacinta will also pop these links in the chat bar for you. Um, please feel free to take a look and online at our um, inclusive practice spaces on the Aberdeen website, which is www.abdn.ac.uk. And, ha you know, have a look around and there is an opportunity to apply online. If you have some questions that you would like to ask before thinking about applying, our generic email address for the programme is ip at abdn.ac dot uk and we'll be more than happy to answer your questions but often we get questions around fees and funding opportunities and i think that's a really important thing to acknowledge so I, jacinta will also post a link thank you jacinta i can't see you but um i know you'll be on it um for that gives information about the cost but i did want to flag that often there is funding available through local authorities. So if you work within a local authority, um, you might want to go to the person who organises continuing professional learning opportunities and ask them, um, this is in Scotland, apologies for anyone further afield, ask them if there might be any opportunities for funding for undertaking um, a course or two courses in inclusive practice. Then the Scottish government have been generous recently in supporting the funding that goes in through the, the local authorities. So it's definitely worth exploring to see if there's funding available because um, it can be a, um, a big personal commitment otherwise. Um, however, if you end up um, self-funding, um, we can also, we can, we can ensure that you get a really beneficial experience. OK, I'm going to stop talking there. And um, Jacinta, if there's any questions, you might need to put your microphone on to share them with me. Hi, Kirsten. Hi. So we do have a few questions, um, if you're ready for me to go through them. Great. Yes, please. So the first question um, is from Anonymous. I'm interested in doing maybe a PG cert or PG dip. Can I choose any of the courses available or are these set courses we have to take? Good question. Thank you for that. So if you're interested in doing a postgraduate certificate or diploma in inclusive practice, then you have to take these courses. If you're interested in a more generic um, Masters of Education, which is also wonderful, um, then we do have at this School of Education uh, a, a flexible Masters route where you'll be able to select from a much wider range of programmes, for example, counselling, mindfulness, um, my goodness, I'll not be able to detail them all, um, guidance, headship courses, so you get a much wider cho um, choice and then you would graduate um, or you would exit with a PG, a postgraduate certificate in education and it's you don't have the specific inclusive practice part, but um, it's a, a more generic course, but with much wider range of choices. And if you are interested in that, um, I don't know the 
email address off the top of my head, um, but if you email ip at abdn.ac.uk, we can we can point you in the right direction. Thanks, Kirsten. Um, we have another question from Hannah. Hello, Kirsten. I did a PG cert. If I did a PG cert now, can I take a break and come back to complete the PG diploma and master's later? Again, another great question. Thank you, Hannah. Um, so there is a, a time limit, limit, but it is it does give you sort of a bit of space and flexibility. So I believe it, you have seven years between starting and finishing. Um, so usually if you did everything, you know, straight after the other, one year would be to postgraduate certificate level, year two would be diploma level and year three and four full master's level. So you can see that you've almost got three years that you can play with um, if you wanted to expand your time. And we know life happens. You start these things and your world can change and go off in a completely different direction. So we tend to be, you know, with, with take individual circumstances into consideration also. Thanks again, Kirsten. We have another question. I currently have a primary registration, but work in secondary as a support for learning teacher. I would like to work towards ASN registration. The GTCS website suggests that a PG cert is required is the required qualification. Is this correct? Yeah, I would go with whatever the GTCS say, because that's the first place I check. So when I get inquiries from people saying, what do I need to um, get a particular ASN qualification? That means additional support needs. Um, I The first place I check is the GTCS. So that's what their website says. Um, I know it, it depends a little on your background and what your qualifications are, which route you take into teaching. If you uh, became a teacher in Scotland or if you became a teacher somewhere else, it can vary. So the best place to check is there. And if you're still a bit hesitant, they're very helpful. So if you send them an email or give them a ring, they will give you the most up to date information. And um, yeah, so that that would maybe open more doors for you, which would be great. OK. Our next question is, is, well, it's more of a statement. I am interested in doing a PG dip in secondary education. OK, so the, the, the great thing, if, if you are interested in you're in secondary school there, I, as far as I'm aware at Aberdeen, we don't do any courses specifically in um, you know just secondary education. However, all of the courses are applicable within a secondary context. So you can, this is where you have space to tailor things and make your particular inquiries bespoke to you and your context. So um, you can, you know, bring the insights from in inclusive practice, for example, uh, into a secondary context. Absolutely, our students do this all the time and it works really well. Um, but likewise, you might have a different interest and you can also apply them in a secondary context. Great, thanks Kirsten. Our next question is from Liz. I worked as a primary teacher for a few years, but took a few years out to have a family. Now I'm looking to maybe study inclusive practice and return to work. Do I need to be actively working to join the program or experience is enough? Thank you, Liz. Really nice question. Because of the nature of assessments, it's more helpful if you're in the workplace so that you can, you know, have something real and current and timely to reflect on to make those slight changes to your practice. Um, however, I am aware that you know people's circumstances can be can be different and we do try and be in, as inclusive as possible so maybe what to do Liz is send me an email and we can talk about your particular circumstances um, but I have had students who have um, undertaken a course by while well, being in supply it can be more challenging 
because you can feel like you have slightly less autonomy, agency to make change. Um, but that's just something else to explore and reflect on. It is possible. Um, so yeah, let, let, let me know. You can send me an email and we can see what we can figure out. OK, thanks, Kirsten. Our next question is from Rachel. Hello, Kirsten. Where would be the point of entry if you have a PGDE? Ah, thank you, Rachel. You would begin you could begin with any of the courses, Rachel. I would recommend beginning with inclusive pedagogy, which begins each January. We, we run the inclusive pedagogy course. You can start anywhere, um, but the inclusive pedagogy course sort of sets some of the foundational um, concepts and ideas that are useful for all the other courses. So um, your PGDE, um, depending where you studied, actually, you might have some level 11 credits. That's master's level credits, or it might have been fully at level 10. So again, you can let me know. We can talk about your exact circumstances. If you did have some level 11 credits, if they are relevant, i.e. Uh, relate to some of the key cor course ideas and concepts, then we can um, we can take a look at that and see if you can transfer any of those credits. Uh, if they're not so relevant, if they're a bit more generic, that's also fine. And you might be interested in doing um, a more flexible master's route, as I described earlier, that you can pick from a much larger repertoire of courses. So, yeah, lots of opportunities there, lots of things to consider. So, yes, let us know, um, get in touch and we can help you navigate a path that will work for you. Great, thanks, Kirsten. We have an attendee asking how many students um, we typically have on the programme. Yeah, nice. Thank you. Usually around, uh, well, it used to be when I first took over, we were maybe around 15 to 20. Now we're usually hitting 30 students, which is wonderful. Um, it's a great number. It, it, it'll sort of allows for lots of dynamic conversations to uh, to take place. Um, so, yeah, that that tends to be where where we're sitting at. Thanks, question. Um, how does the course selection work if I'm carrying in credits completed prior to beginning the MED? I currently have 20 or 30 credits achieved at Aberdeen in the 2019-20 PGDE, PGDE cohort. Ah, nice. So I assume then you did the level 11 credits there. So if you did the level 11 credits at Aberdeen, um, they're they're fantastic credits but they're not specific enough to inclusive practice so i can't transfer them onto my program um or the inclusive practice program i should say but if you would and i, th I think it's worth making use of your credits isn't it and um, so you could explore whether you could use them towards um the emed flexible route um so Again, if you get in touch with us, we can point you in the right direction and you can explore if that's possible. I'm, I'm sure it will be. OK, thank you, Kirsten. Um, we have a question from another attendee asking if they can take the course if they are currently working in a nursery. Yes, absolutely. We'd love to have you. Perfect. Those are all the questions we have so far. Um, so we'll maybe give it a few minutes um, just to allow anyone else if they have any other questions. Sounds feel like a good right. idea. Yeah, many thanks for those excellent questions, folks. Okay, we've just have one popped through. Wonderful. I only have an ordinary degree, but have a PGCE and 16 experience of 16 years of teaching experience. Sorry. Could I still apply without an honours? Yes, please do. You've got 16 years experience. That's wonderful. So please do apply and we'll take a look at your your personal profile and make a decision based on that.
have a little break. Um, no more questions at the moment. So just, oh. just wait a few minutes. And yeah, no problem. And if, if questions come to mind after we finish this evening's session, don't hesitate to get in touch. Um, I'll warn um, our admin support, Heather, that there might be a few questions coming through the email tomorrow. And I'll, I'll tell her just to pop them my way. <laughs> so IP at abdn.ac.uk because I know what it's like. It's often a bit later when you're relaxed and you've had time to think that the questions pop into your head. So, um, you know, don't hesitate to get in touch. OK, I think those are all the questions we're going Brilliant. to. Brilliant. That's wonderful. They were great questions. Thank you so much for asking and thank you for coming along this evening, everybody. I hope it's been helpful. It's very hard to know what would be useful to know, um, but it's uh, the programme is a joy to teach on and I certainly learn more and more and more each through each course from my students. They're, you know, and it's great to see um, our students growing in confidence. Um, just just this year, some of the students have been um, publishing bits from their assignments and, you know, all sorts of things. So it's nice to have a growing community and a really supportive one at that where we can celebrate what teachers are doing because you're all doing fantastic things. So really good to give you this platform. It's real a real pleasure of the job. So um, I'd love to hear from you and uh, potentially look forward to meeting some of you in January. And thank you so much, Jacinta, for keeping us all right and holding everything together. <laughs>